praising God today for our salvation. And the one and only that points us to the Father, Yeshua ben Elohim. There is a name I call upon There is a name by which I am saved Salvation Which is our response to the gospel. You've always got to give the gospel so that somebody has something to respond to. Alright? Part of what I'm doing today is discussing the uh, these half-truths and misconceptions and traditions of man, which in whoever's best uh, you know, best by somebody's best effort at one point in time. They might have made a mistake. They might have left something out. They might have forgotten about one thing or another. And all the way down the line, you have denominations, you have complications, and um, any other such things that has led to confusion over the uh, years, over the centuries and generations. But God's word is always right on. We can trust it. And it's the time-tested manner that we all are going to live by. So <clears throat> when I tell you something like 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, that Paul explained how that he was declaring the gospel to those Corinthians. Uh, hey. says, let me join. <laughs> let me get this right. Okay. When he said, I'm going to declare the gospel to you, Corinthians, um, by which you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, um, unless you believed in vain. So he's talking about the possibility of backsliders and things of that nature where somebody could have belief at one point and then fall away from the truth or just stop following, that sort of thing. Um, he said, I deliver to you first that which I received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures um, and then he goes down a list of witnesses like Cephas being Peter and uh, all the twelve and then last of all him himself Paul and um, he also mentions that there was about uh, by he, he talks also about how there was uh, approximately 500 other people that saw him alive so he's discussing the cross, the death, burial, the resurrection and even the people who witnessed it alright now people have taken this one passage and then they have built entire denominations on it where they have said, okay, Paul phrased it just so. Let's make sure we don't go crossways of that because we got respect for Paul as an apostle and he was the, the apostle to the Gentiles and everything. All right. But what I'm going to ask you is to reconcile the idea that 
Jesus himself was not actually preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. He wasn't preaching about the cross, even though that he said, hey, anybody that wants to be my disciple, they better take up their cross and follow me. As we study the scripture, we learn that he only mentioned his time on the cross to a very small inner circle of friends, his close disciples. Okay, so he, for all those two and a half years, three years before he had that conversation, and it says he only mentioned it a few times, um, we know that from the time he came back from the wilderness in power, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that he was preaching some kind of gospel, therefore what was it? All right, in Mark 1, 15, well, I'm going to say Mark 1, 14 and 15. He, uh, it tells us, and being chapter 1, we know this is talking about from the beginning of his ministry and all, and it phrases it that the way anyway. Um, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. All right. So after that, everywhere else that it tells us that Jesus gave a parable, the, these parables would begin with the kingdom of God is like, or when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he said, um, he just gave three chapters worth of what is life like in the kingdom of God and how should a person uh, conduct their life if they're a citizen of the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 3, uh, where you get the most famous verse in the world, which is John 3.16, and everybody pretty much knows it by heart, but the beginning of that same conversation in the same chapter of Scripture with the same guy, Nicodemus, he says, except you be born again of water and spirit, you can neither see nor enter the kingdom of God. So all over the place, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, equating its message to the gospel. He's calling it the gospel. And then in Matthew 24, where he talks about the end of the world, and they're asking him, what will the end of the world be like? In uh, verse 4, uh, let's see. Oh, that's the wrong page. Matthew 24, 14. He says, after he's described the deceptions that would come, after he's described the wars and rumors of wars and nations rising against nations, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, um, and the beginning of sorrows, and the persecution that will, uh, says they shall rise up and kill you, um, and the offense of many, and all these things, and false prophets, and the love of many people waxing cold, and he says those that shall endure to the end shall be saved, he then tells us uh, at the end of the passage, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So right up until the time that the end comes, it's the gospel of the kingdom which is to be preached. It is not to disparage nor discredit nor give some alternative to the cross. It's actually in conjunction with the cross. There's a little bit of debate about uh, the passage 1 John 5, 7, and people still fight about it to this day. But I'll just tell you what the Bible says. Um, well, I'll skip to verse 8. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So we're not talking about an alternative gospel. We're talking about a part of the gospel that agrees together. He said that except you're born again of water and spirit. And here it says that uh, the spirit and the water agree, as does also the blood. And the blood, of course, is where the cross comes into the picture. So is everybody clear about how that these things are, they're all in agreement and we're not talking about some other gospel or some other version or anything? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's the, uh, that's the main thing I want to clarify up front because it's one of the things that is leading countless people astray um, in different churches all over the world 
Uh, not that it's bad to preach about the cross or the death, the burial or the resurrection. It's just bad to leave out the kingdom because where the message of the cross pertains to our eternal salvation and eternal life, the message of the kingdom pertains to life right now and how we should be living. Because especially in America and in the West in general where uh, people tend to treat it as though it were the democracy of God or something like that where you get a vote, this is actually the monarchical, monarchical monarchy, the kingdom of God. So we have to treat the Lord, which literally means he's the boss, as though he were the king because he is. And if there's four things uh, that we've learned over time that kingdoms have in common, obviously they've got a king. That's pretty self-explanatory. And we know who that is. Um, they have laws. And the word of the king is law in a kingdom. So we are to live by the words of Jesus. And he says, whosoever has my words and keeps them is my disciple. He said, whoever lives by my words at the end of... Uh, they build their life by my words at the end of Matthew 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you mean. Um, he says, I liken that person to one who built their house on a rock, as opposed to the alternative being they built their house on the sand, the storm comes, it sinks, it falls over. Great is the fall of that life, that house, because they didn't build on the rock. All right, so keeping the words of the king is pivotal, it's critical to living in the kingdom. And where is the kingdom? Jesus would say that uh, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, And he said that um, like my people, if they, that he told Pilate, they would fight for me if my kingdom was of this world, but it's actually the kingdom of heaven. And you'll see in the scriptures that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they're synonymous. They're, they're the same thing is said in different gospels with interchangeable terms. And then finally, Every kingdom has citizens. So to be a citizen of God's kingdom, like we said in John 3, you have to be born of water and spirit, or you don't get to participate. And that's, you can't enter, and you can't even see it. That's what Jesus said. Okay. So, understanding the message that when Jesus came healing the sick and casting out devils and raising the dead, people were amazed, and when they came to him to say, what is all this about? He would tell them, and he would, just as he told the disciples that he sent out, inform the people when you do these things likewise, that um, you, you know, the kingdom of God is come near to you. And he's telling them, believe in this message. So that is the kingdom gospel. And over time, it also led directly into the rest of his works, which was at Calvary and his death and burial and resurrection on the cross, the atonement, and the blood, because without the, for, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Okay, so you can preach all of it together. And as we already covered, they're not um, alternatives. They're just in agreement. And people have been leaving out half the message for too long. So it can't be overstated. All right. Everybody clear on the gospel? Uh, all right. In full. All right. There we go. The kingdom gospel. The kingdom gospel. And now it includes the cross. Yep. Okay, and that's, that was Paul preaching, hey, here's the latest developments. Um, so, anyhow. Moving on. Is everybody familiar with the concept of uh, what is a type and shadow? Does anybody know what a type and shadow is? Type and shadow? A type and shadow. In the Bible? And shadow? Mm-hmm. All right. It's a metaphor. Uh, things happened one way and time went on and the things that happened before now happen again but they're even greater this time around because we're getting closer and closer to the birth of the kingdom of God which has really already happened. Um, there were various miracles that happened in the Old Testament and in the New Testament there were many, 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 many more miracles. Okay, And in the Old Testament to have the Spirit of God and to work miracles, you have to be somebody special. In the New Testament, you just have to be somebody special to God. And He loves everybody that believes in Him. Okay? And He really he loves the whole world, but He calls you to be His people. Alright? So, I'm nobody special, but, hey, how's your knee? Better today? 
Okay, they, inf they were informed. There you go. I, I am not special, but I prayed for his busted knee last night and he got healed. That's because the kingdom gospel works. All right, and the same. Yeah. All right, I've seen it a hundred times now. When I was a denominational Christian, I used to believe that if I lived my whole life and had faith, then one day I was sure to see a gospel miracle uh, because I at least had that much faith. You know, uh, if I live a hundred years, I might actually see a real miracle. I don't know if God laughs or cries at that statement, but He wanted me to have the real thing. And so when I got born again, within a month, I started seeing people healed and stuff all over the place. I, I, I went around healing the sick in the city of Birmingham for a year before he had to tell me to stop. Do not heal one more person if you are not also willing to tell them to repent. Okay, because the, the, it's not miracles for the sake of miracles. Um, the old timers say miracles are the dinner bell for the gospel. And when he uh, sent his people out, he actually didn't send them just to go street preach. He sent them to go do the works of God and you know expose people to the miracles of God that are part of his kingdom. And then when they were interested in that, then give them the gospel. And if people saw the miracles, if they believed in God, if they received the message of the gospel, then they wanted to know and I'll show you in the Bible, uh, what should we do next with this information? All right? Uh, that's what we're talking about today. But to touch on the subject of um, metaphorical types and shadows, in the beginning you had the whole world that was covered with water. Um, in Jewish tradition, apparently there was there was something going on with the world before the story begins in Genesis, but we don't have a lot of information on that. There's only a couple places in the Bible that even says anything about it. Um, and it's tough to draw many conclusions, just that it was. However, we come in at the point where the earth and the water and this deep, dark void. Then fast forward a little bit. Noah's flood. God floods the world with water. All right. Later in the New Testament, the apostle would say uh, he would draw the conclusion as a comparison. Uh, he would draw the comparison that Noah's family was saved by water and uh, the rest of the world perished. Look at the book of Exodus. God's people, they experienced miracles first. Um, they witnessed the old getting destroyed. And then they were led by God's representative to the water. And then when they crossed the Red Sea, um, they escaped Egypt finally. They didn't go straight to the Promised Land. They had to go to Sinai and start learning about the ways of God. But um, just to reiterate the fact for the next generation, because the first people became unfaithful over time, and they all died in the wilderness, but their children were permitted to enter into the promised land later. And they still had to cross the river again and got the water. And this time it was at the Jordan River, I mean. And God provided us basically the same miracle again, where he, they parted the waters of the Jordan River and they all crossed over. And it said that it piled up all the way back, all the way back to a town called Adam, believe it or not. So... What I'm trying to paint a picture here of is that God has had a very long-term plan involving salvation through water. It doesn't mean that this is not the blood or that it is the, uh, better than the blood or some alternative to blood. It means that the water and the blood and the spirit agree, as we already said, but you've got to go back over these things because people will want to argue with you about it and fight you about it. Just remember that they agree. They're not in opposition. All right. Now, when the tabernacle came, the Levites, they weren't able to enter into the presence of God and serve him except they washed first. Okay, so you've got that. Yet, if you wanted to even go up to the thing, you had to pass the water. Uh, and it was every bit of it. God put things in deliberate order in certain places, whether you interacted with it or whether you were just in, you know, adjacent to it. 
whatever and however, God always had his design in mind. Uh, now, uh, you also, you know, take Naaman uh, in the time of, of the prophets. He was told to go and wash in the waters of the Jordan seven times and God cleansed them. Um, of course, you know, that was because of leprosy. But God is, again, using a metaphor to talk about how clean a person becomes spiritually on the inside. He's always pointing forwards. And now we're in the days where this is the protocol and we've got all this stuff to look back on and, and prove it over and over and over again. So I don't even know how many metaphors there are for it in the Bible, but there's a lot. Uh, okay, I'm going to get started with hard scriptures on baptism there, JT. If you want to get, uh, let's go to, um, first of all, let's go to John chapter 3. Just as a, sort of an appetizer here. Because it's wherever possible, and it's probably always possible if you think hard enough, it's best to start with the Lord as our example today. For all those Old Testament examples, let's stick with uh, Jesus walked as a man, and what did he do? Okay, has anybody ever heard that Jesus baptized not his own disciples, but uh, the disciples baptized for him? Um, okay, well, that's another one of those misconceptions. Uh, can you bring up... Uh, John 4, 1 through 3. In fact, it's just 1 through 2. John 4? Yep, the first two verses. Okay. So here it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, uh, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, etc. But under the context of Verse 2, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So, it does say that. However, please bring up John chapter 3, verse 22. This is after the conversation with Nicodemus, where he talked about being born of water and spirit. And he gave John 3, 16 and stuff. Alright, so this is where the conversation with Nicodemus ends. And now it says, this is before chapter 4, mind you. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Who tarried with them? He. Who baptized? He. Who is he? Jesus. Okay, so there's an easy example of how the church, you've heard it before, you just said, you know, you nodded your head. They believe otherwise, and the Bible says this. Okay? So after he baptized his own 12 disciples, potentially more, but I think that that's what's being communicated here because he said he was with them. Then he handed off baptizing duties to the disciples once he had shown them how to do it because that fits with his pattern. Everything the disciples did, they saw Jesus do it first. Everything Jesus said and did, he saw the Father do it first. It continues on down the line. So that's a really easy one for you to, you know, make people stop and think about something they may not have ever realized before. I was taught that it was the other way too. All right. So lots of people are getting baptized when they come to believe in Jesus, and then they start following him around. Oh, went too far. Go to Acts chapter 2, please, because we're going to start going through the list. The reason for it is because this is one of the most thoroughly covered topics in the New Testament. Um, it's, it's even one of the most thoroughly, copy, thoroughly covered topics in the Bible. There's no reason that the church should be this ignorant on it. Because this is going to take a few minutes to go through the list. Uh, is a lot of information there. All right, go to verse 37, please. We've covered the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls upon all who believe and they're in the upper room and they have this tongues of fire on their head and they're speaking with other tongues and they're prophesying and praising the Lord. It causes a commotion. People come and they're there for a feast called Pentecost, which is in the summertime. And they're like, whoa, what is going on with all these people and why the commotion at 9 o'clock in the morning? And that point... 
Peter stands up and he prophesies to them out of the book of Joel. He, he says, this is that that you heard about from the prophet Joel. And he basically gives them a refresher on the gospel. And he's communicating to these Jews that, hey, remember that Messiah you've been waiting for for like four or five hundred years? Yeah, that was Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, and you killed him. Because many of these people were like the same people who were there at Pilate's palace or what have you, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And now it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What should we do with this information? Oh my gosh, we killed him. Now, here we go. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? He did not say for the purpose of joining the church. He did not say uh, for it is an outward sign of an inward change. Or winning an award or getting a certificate or none of that. None of it. He said it is literally for. There you go. The remission of sins. Now, if we um, we know that it's the blood of Jesus that is salvation. Okay, right? But there's no mention of the word blood here. No, it is mentioned previously. He already talked about it. He talked about how you Jews killed your Messiah. They know what happened a few weeks ago and that how he was on the cross. Everybody's heard. And they've even heard that he was resurrected and that he's been walking around and people have been seeing him in the meantime. All right? So they were clear on the message of the blood. When somebody is believing in the sacrifice of Jesus, this message of the water is in agreement with the message of the blood. Okay? Now, for the promise is unto you, these audience of Jews, and to your children, their lineage, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Um, a guy once recently asked me, I don't see any evidence of anybody ever prophesying something without knowing they were prophesying it ahead of time. There's an example right there. When Peter said, all that are afar off, Scripture is clear that at this time, he didn't know Gentiles could also be saved, and that that would happen sometime later. So he was only referring to Jews, but the Spirit in him was prophesying salvation unto all the world. Because Jesus himself had said, go into all the world and uh, preach the kingdom and do the works of God. And that the um, message of repentance and remission of sins should be preached. I believe that's Luke 24, 49 off the top of my head. Well, anyway, we'll keep going. So he's saying it's being communicated by the Spirit of God. This is the promise. And Jesus said, wait for the promise in Jerusalem until this day happened. And he says that it's for the Jews that are in attendance, their children in the future, and actually the whole world beyond. Even as, uh, let's see, and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. That means perverse or upside down. Okay, so literally the word save is in this message. This is what you call salvation doctrine. Okay, it is not a sinner's prayer, which, yeah, as people said in the Bible, God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Well, in the Psalms, it also talks about how there is the prayer, on the other hand, of the man with a broken and contrite spirit. It's phrased something like that. And it says, uh, this prayer God will hear. So, if you're going to do anything, be broken and contrite over the state of your life and sin and stuff like that, and repent, and God will start hearing your prayers. That's, That's the will of God. Yeah. 
And that's why Peter began with the word repent. Okay? Repent literally means turn around. Um, a pastor once explained to me how that, you know, in the military when soldiers are marching, they get to the end of the field, and in America we say what? About face? In Britain, they literally get to the end of the field, and the field officer says, repent! And they turn around and come back. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to turn from the direction that we are going and turn back to God. Okay? And it's just that simple. That's what repentance really is. You'll figure out, as you actually attempt to do it, what it means for you. Because not everybody's a thief. Not everybody's a murderer. But everybody's a sinner. And we have different sins between us. However, He wants you to turn from all that. He wants you to turn from the whole world. And put your focus on the kingdom of God. In Isaiah, it says, He'll keep you in perfect peace whosoever um, hath their mind stayed upon God. All right. <clears throat> now, so that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And about 3,000 people were saved. All right. Let's go now over to Acts uh, chapter 8. A lot's been happening and there's lots of miracles and everybody's excited because of the explosive growth in the church and things like this. And uh, now the uh, psycho Shaul, Saul the Pharisee, is attacking the church. And um, they begin to spread out, which is what Jesus wanted them to do in the first place. And they didn't do it, so persecution came and did it for them. And now they're going everywhere. Okay, one of these believers is named Philip the Evangelist, and he went up to Samaria, or actually the Bible says he went down to Samaria. Um, and being an evangelist, and he's actually the only evangelist mentioned in Scripture, his MO, his modus operandi was to do miracles and amaze the people, and when they saw them, he would preach the gospel, and they would believe. When they believe, they were baptized. Uh, if you go down to, say, like, um, verse 12, it'll say it. And it'll also mention that after they were baptized in the name of Jesus, they had to call for the apostles to lay hands upon the believers in that area because they had not yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, water baptism is the idea that there's this good work you do unto God because He already gave you Jesus Christ. When you make your move because He made His move, then it's time for God to make a move again. And He fills you with the Holy Ghost in time. Sometimes it happens right away. Sometimes it happens immediately. But my point is, most of the church believes that, well, as soon as you feel like it, you have the Holy Ghost. As soon as you say you do, we'll just take the word for it. As soon as you confess your belief, or as soon as you, um, you know, even get baptized, you automatically just have it. It says right here in verse 12 of Acts 8 that these people, this whole nation of people, did not have the Holy Ghost, even though they'd been water baptized. So we're talking about two separate things here. And God's not withholding it from anybody, but it just doesn't always happen at exactly the same time. And sometimes it does. Uh, what's going on? Uh, lost connection. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. If you want to go to that verse again, that's fine, but I'll, I'll move on. Uh, in chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, so we had Jews first, then Samaritans, who were ex-Jews, basically. And now we're going to talk about Gentiles. Okay. Yep. Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, uh, a centurion um, from a group called the Italian Band. Okay, so this is a Roman. He's a devout man, one that feared God with all his house. And he gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Okay, so this is a Roman an Italian Roman who was sent to go do his job in Judea, the land of the Jews, and even though he was raised as a polytheistic uh, heathen, 
When he lived among the Jews, he saw the difference of their monotheistic God who was one, and over however long he was there, apparently long enough to build a house and stuff, um, and raise his family, he began to become a believer in their God instead. And he began to fear God and pray to God always. All right? So continuing, he saw in a vision um, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius, you've done so many good works, God thinks you're saved now. Uh, he's just sent me to let you know. Yeah. Does it say that on here? No? Okay. It literally says something different. Cornelius. When he looked at him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men unto a place called Joppa and call for one called Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with another Simon who is a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou ought to do. Okay, so my point was, when I phrased it that way, he was not saved by his works, we all know that, but um, what he did do, his attempt to get close to God was noticed by God. So God sent him a messenger and said, go find somebody who does know what you should do. And that guy's name is Peter. And these are the things that Peter said. So the rest of the whole, um, the rest of the whole chapter talks about how Peter delivers the gospel to them, and that even as he was speaking the gospel, the the um, the Holy Ghost fell on his whole house, which means his family, and everybody started speaking in other tongues and prophesying and praising the Lord and stuff. And he was amazed because this was that moment that. I told you before, he prophesied about it, but didn't know he prophesied about it. However many years later this was, this was that moment that Peter learned, oh my gosh, even Gentiles can be saved. Um, skip over down to verse 44. Some other Jews came with him just to, for the trip. All right. While Peter yet spake the words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, which be the Jews, which believed, they were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they began to speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can anybody forbid the water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they prayed him to tarry and stay with him a few days. Okay, so first of all, he's amazed that even so-called outsiders, Gentiles, who were not Israel, um, can receive the Holy Ghost. They're being born again of spirit. And because they got born again of spirit, he then asks these other Jews, has anybody got a problem with this? And nobody's going, huh? So he said, well, I command you to be baptized then. And emphasis is placed on the idea that he didn't suggest it or he didn't like imply that they should be baptized, but he commanded them to immediately obey. And that is the message that Peter gave to Cornelius who had a visitation from an angel of God that told him, go find this guy and he'll give you instructions. So there you have it. So it wasn't a college degree. Nope. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, meanwhile, the only guy who had something even similar to a college degree, Saul, uh, let's move on and see what he believed about the subject. Um, so that covers Gentiles coming in. Go to, ver uh, go to chapter 19. Saul's been doing a lot in the meantime, and these days it goes by Paul. Um, we're doing this chronologically. But I'm going to retouch on what he was doing after this chronological point in time. Because later he gives a really good account of how it happened for him. But it happened before this. But I'm going to start here. 
it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to a place called Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Hey, have ye received the Holy Ghost since you believers, disciples, believed? Your disciples, you believe, have you received the Holy Ghost yet? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Imagine that. And he said unto them, Well, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto him, Unto well, John's baptism. You know? So then Paul says, Well, you know, John, he verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. We're talking about John the Baptist here. Um, but he preached about the one that would come after, who's Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus also. Uh, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. And there was about 12 of these guys. So, that's only like the minimal details of a, probably a longer conversation. They probably had some questions and stuff. Uh, but these are the high points, obviously. Anyway, that's what the Bible says. Um, they were believers of a sort, but they didn't have all the information. And God saw to it, evidently, that he would send Paul on his other journeys to turn aside and uh, you know, make sure that he crossed paths with these guys. Because it's not, you know, everybody wants to accuse baptism as being, oh, it's a work of salvation. You're trying to save yourself by works, whatever. God sent Paul to do the work of baptism because he wanted them to be fully saved. Evidently, God himself didn't want people to miss out on something that he has as the plan of salvation. And they didn't have a problem with it. There was about 12 guys. They probably huddled up. What do you think? You know, anybody know this guy? What do you think? It does make sense. Yeah, he did talk about, you know, John the Baptist. Not him, but another guy. That, he says it's Jesus of Nazareth. You heard of that guy? Yeah, I think I've heard of him. They say he died on the cross and he rose again. Let's do it. And they all got baptized. In the end. That's how it went down, basically. Nobody had any kind of fight about it like we do today. It just was what it was and they complied with the guy that was in authority. All right? He knew what was up. Okay, so I talked about how that the, um, the sinner's prayer, uh, which is found in Romans 10, 9 and 10, specifically. I'll read it to you. Uh, go ahead and pull it up. What was that again? Romans 10, 9 and 10. This is what most churches believe is salvation doctrine today. Okay. The if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? Shalt, meaning like not right now, but you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right? So that's not a problem with that. It's in our holy book. But the problem becomes, how are you elevating that as a, this, this one thing as opposed to all the other scriptures that say something else? All right? All um, right. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek or Gentile. For the same Lord gave, the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 13. Alright, so the guy who wrote that, when he called upon the name of the Lord in his own testimony... Go to Acts 22, 16, please. He had had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. He was blinded and uh, sent up ahead to the city to sit there and wait for one of God's disciples to show up and heal him. And 
when that guy healed him and his eyes were unblinded, and his name was Ananias, the, the righteous Ananias, evidently, um, what, he says, now, why tarriest thou, Paul, you was Saul in those days, why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So the very guy who said, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, also tells this, uh, the Jews who were having him arrested, when I called upon the name of the Lord, I got baptized. Okay? And I washed away my sins. If only the blood washes away your sins, then what has baptism got to do with it? They agree. They're not a different, it's not a different gospel. These things agree. Okay? So that's what happened to Paul, the guy who wrote Romans 10, 9, and 10. And why we're suffering under the misconception of this thing called the sinner's prayer these days, according to my best research, this essentially started with the Billy Graham Crusades in like this, maybe I guess the late 60s and 70s, and they were filling up whole stadiums. And I've heard somebody explain in, uh, you know, among the, the circles that are like hardcore X-238 people, well, like us, that Graham was confronted with somebody who said, like, look, we understand that you, you've rented these venues for only so long, you've, uh, you know, it's a time crunch, you know, everybody can't be baptized right away and, and all this, but you're, you're elevating this convenient little tool you've come up with called the sinner's prayer as if it were salvation itself. You know, it's good for people to pray and ask God to, to save them, but you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. These people need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost because unless they're born again, they can't see or enter the kingdom. And they were told by Graham, obviously I wasn't there, that he said, I know Acts 2.38, I believe in Acts 2.38, but you're, look, 100,000 people here, like, I can't, it won't work. I, I can't baptize 100,000 people, etc. That was his position. However he phrased it, and then he never went back to it after the fact, and by the time that he died, he was saying stuff like, oh yeah, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, everybody can go to heaven. It doesn't matter if you know Jesus or not. Yeah, so he there, said that before he died. There was a mass baptism too, where Jesus they baptized thousands in one day. It took the course of a day. Good, I'm glad that they did that. Um, but we need to stick with the program of what actually is in the Bible. And a lot of people walked away from those meetings saying, well, I'm, I'm as good as saved now. And then they continued on their way, living their life their own way. And they didn't live like they were part of the kingdom. Um, now, I, I try to not be a Billy Graham critic because essentially before my time. But what I can say is this. That the Lord prepared me for my own water baptism for one year with a prophetic dream. And everything that happened in that prophetic dream occurred to me over the course of that year. And babe, you were a witness for it. The day that he told me you can get baptized right now, what happened with the text message in John? Remember? <laughs> okay, but she was there. You remember when... I told you that and we were at the hibachi place and you were like, great, you should get baptized now. And I went to call Brother John who prayed for me to have that dream a year prior and I had a text message waiting for me from Brother John that said, the Lord just told me it's time for you to get baptized. There was a record-breaking cold snap in February that particular year and um, in the third week of the year, because I'm thinking like, we're between churches, where am I gonna get baptized? I don't wanna get hypothermia. And the Lord was telling me, just wait. In the third week thereof, a record-breaking heat wave came through and cleared it all up. And I was driving to church one morning, I mean, uh, no, I was driving to work one morning, and I turned on the radio and it said, World famous evangelist Billy Graham has died at his home in Virginia this morning, surrounded by friends and family. And immediately the Lord told me, get baptized today. I cannot wait. So I got baptized the day Billy Graham died. And, you know, where Paul said in the scriptures, I am not called to baptize, I actually am called to baptize. 
And I don't promote the idea of what Billy Graham promoted, this sinner's prayer doctrine. I promote the Bible doctrine, which is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I don't know if you want to hit all these, um, but just to go down quickly down a list of uh, other places it talks about in the Bible, um, this very doctrine and all the other times that it was mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, where is my list? Here it is. Okay. Water baptism and salvation. In Mark 16, 16, that's where he says that those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Okay? Uh, it's, it does not say those who are saved shall get baptized. It says those who are baptized shall be saved. It literally says that. Um, you got John 3, 5, which is the conversation with Nicodemus. Um, it says it's for the remission of sins in Hebrews 9, 22. Well, it's talking about obedience. Um, in Luke 24, 47, that's, that's where it says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Okay, and remission of sins is through this thing that God has established called baptism. Um, it calls it elementary principles in Hebrews 6. 1 and 2. So it's foundational stuff that people should understand. And if you're building on the wrong foundation, what does God say that's going to happen? You're, you're, it's all going to crumble when you find out the truth. In Matthew 28, 19, it says um, that he, God is telling people, go into all the world and preach, uh, teach people everything which I've taught you um, and baptize them in the Name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost in most translations. Okay, so how do we reconcile that? Uh, well, the way that we reconcile that, at least the way I do, is pointing to the fact that there was an ancient text found that uh, says the evidence of Eusebius's writings which were preserved. Um, and it has the translation here, and it reads, and it's got the original language too, Go disciple ye all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Okay? So even if that wasn't the case, it would still be the one example in Scripture, and it's not even a watertight example. Because if you understand Matthew, uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 9, 6, where he talks about the Christ child, and he says that the baby Jesus... <coughs> But he, and it's who he's talking about. And he says, uh, well, I'll read it so we're, so, so we're, the, we're clear. Isaiah 9, 6. <laughs> unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's talking about the baby Jesus, and it calls him the everlasting father. It calls him the almighty God. It says this is his name. And Jesus said, baptize in the name. And they always baptized in his name. So connect the dots. Um, <clears throat> but to finish the list. How do we address Matthew 28, 19? That's what I'm saying. That was Matthew 28, 19. When um, you therefore teach the nations, baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's what I was just covering. And I, I always point people to Isaiah 9 6. Isaiah 9 6. The, the, I was trying to keep up with you there. Well, then it needed to be repeated then. Because the name of the child shall be called Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Everlasting Father. So it's saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay, the, the emphasis is, I, I don't have the, uh, the Trinity versus oneness debate at all anymore. I don't, I don't go there, I don't entertain it. Right. Honestly, I, I think the, the enemy is using that to derail people and come away from unity. The fact is that Jesus said the greatest of all commandments is not love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's, again, only the second half of it. He said that the greatest of all commandments is, Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and thou shalt 
love the Lord thy God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. So people, again, they're leaving out half the message. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it's, it's like unto the first. All right. So the church at Jerusalem, 3,000 people were baptized. These were Jews. The church at Samaria, men and women, it says, were baptized, Samaritans. The church at Caesarea, that's where the apostle commands baptism for, for the Gentiles, no less. Uh, the church at Philippi, that's where Lydia and the jailer, they are examples um, in Acts 16. The church at Corinth, they were believed and were baptized in Acts 18.8. The church at Ephesus, Paul rebaptizes certain believers who they had a type of baptism before, but now they had more information. All right. The church at Galatia, they believed and were baptized in Galatians 3. The church at Colossae, they were buried in baptism. And the church at Rome, they were dead to sin and baptized. So before you ever even get to the, uh, the, this so-called sinner's prayer doctrine in Romans 10, you have to read past where it says get baptized in Romans 6. All right. Um, and everywhere it says baptism in the name of Jesus saves, in Matthew 28, 19, the name is singular. Okay? It doesn't say, you know, you get it. Acts 2, 21, they're calling on Jesus. In Acts 2, 38, they repent and are baptized. In Acts 10, 48, it's issued as a command. In Acts 10, 43, it says it's for the remission of sins. Uh, Mark 16, 16, it's made explicit. In Acts 9, 17 through 18, it's Paul's baptism testimony. In Acts 22, 16, Paul elaborates on it. And in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, it says baptism now saves us. That's, that's pretty thorough. Um, but here's another great one. Galatians 3, 27. Uh, in fact, it's a great one to kind of tie it up nicely with. Um, go ahead and put it on the screen. Galatians 3, 27. Alright, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Alright, if, if we're going to walk through those gates one day, we better have like a really close association with the king who owns the gates. And the people who have been baptized into Christ, they have put on Christ. Alright, that's about as close as you can get. <clears throat> some people and I don't know exactly what kind of spirit they're under you'll hear it all the time though what about the thief on the cross the thief on the cross wasn't baptized first of all how do you know that second of all it doesn't matter in Hebrews 9 it tells us that um, uh, it tells us that uh, how does it phrase it um, the Testament is no good until the death of the testator, the person who gives the testament. So that thief was having a conversation with Jesus because Jesus was still alive. All right? Now, Jesus died. Before the thief died, they came along and knocked his knees out. And on the ground. But the point was, Jesus said, you shall be with me this day in paradise. And he didn't have to go through a baptism or anything. He, he, he was going through a baptism right there with Jesus, so to speak, in a certain sense. But moreover, um, when Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, he said, like, he healed a withered guy's hand. Um, and other times, too, when he healed other people, he would say how that, um, you know, I've got the authority to do these things. It's done so that you would know the Son of Man hath authority to forgive sins. To remit sins. And what have we learned is the purpose of water baptism. The remission of sins. Okay, so he had the authority to overrule the, the 
plan and the protocol that people would have done otherwise anyway. The point is, you're not that thief on the cross and you have the opportunity to obey God. And in Hebrews 5, 9, it says that he has become the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So when it comes to, oh, I believe, okay, well, show us your belief by your obedience. That's what the apostle James would say. Uh, and I'm not being, you know, like self-promoting here. I mean, the actual apostle Jesus, uh, James, um, he said, what doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful for the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. But I will show you my faith by my works. What that means is don't even try to challenge me saying that like, you know, well, I have faith and you better just take my word for it. Do what the Bible says. The people who were baptized did what the Bible says and they have shown their faith. When you're saved by faith, it doesn't mean that you just get to tell people how it is. It means that you have been faithful to something. The reason why John 3.16 is the most misquoted verse in the world, even as because of its popularity, is because it doesn't say whosoever believes. It says whosoever believe eth. And the little E-T-H is called a suffix at the end of the word implying a continuation of the root word. So basically it means whosoever continuously believes. All right. Uh, therefore, if you are going to believe by your obedience, then when you follow Jesus, he turns left, you turn left. He turns right, you turn right. He says get baptized, you say how high. Get it? That's what I mean. Jump, jump, get baptized, go in the water. This is what he says to do. So when you obey it, you are putting yourself in the position of being able to tell God, hey, you said to do the thing and I did the thing. I'm walking in obedience. That's so you can see my faith. All right? God's not going to come against somebody for obeying everything that the first century church did their entire history and everything that all apostles, evangelists, and pastors and preachers in the first century church believed in and put into practice. And it wasn't until later that it began to get phased out and the waters were muddied and uh, people began to say this or that and other things. But there's the whole of the matter so that we can make a, a good decision and if a person has counted the cost and they have chosen Jesus Christ and they want to be saved, or even if they've done parts of this or that, Revelation also talks about 